welcome everybody, thank you for coming. I, in the process of interviewing my book, had the great good fortune to interview Tom Brokaw, and it was such an amazing experience that afterward I asked him if he'd be willing to share that with all of you, and he graciously agreed. So tonight I'd like to talk a little bit about the night the Berlin Wall opened, a night that you were there, and your experiences covering that evening. So perhaps we'll start by setting the stage, shall we? Yeah. Uh, Raphael, could we have the image of the Reagan speech, please? This is where Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And there were a lot of people, especially in the State Department, who thought he was going too far, that he'd overstated the United States' determination to confront Gorbachev with that challenge. Reagan being Reagan, knew what he was doing. It didn't bring the wall down, but it did set the stage for a lot of activity, obviously, that was going on in the Soviet Union at the time, because we had the rise of Gorbachev, and an understanding within the leadership, and especially the intellectual leadership of the Soviet Union, about how the system was failing the people. Uh, a friend of mine who, will, for purposes of this discussion, will have to go unnamed by title and by name, was a member of the young intelligentsia around Gorbachev. And I said to him, when did you know that it wouldn't work? He gave me a really interesting answer. He said, when the Koreans came to Moscow with cars and electronics and manufacturing, he said in 1953 they'd been one of the poorest agrarian societies in the world. Here we were on this great economic revolution. We were falling behind every day. We knew it wasn't going well. Reagan came into office determined to have a confrontation with the Soviet Union and, if necessary, with hardware. He was a cold hawk warrior. But other people around him, including Nancy, said there may be an opportunity to do this in a different way. So that was an important speech because it did set the stage. Yeah. And the um, foil, of course, for President Reagan was Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, who had surprised the world when he came into office by introducing reforms, by, by reaching out to, to talk to President Reagan. So even as President Reagan in his second term decided to reach out to the Soviet Union. Amazingly enough, he found someone there to take the call. Well, I think people forget about how exciting it was when Gorbachev arrived. Mm -hmm. We'd had all those men in cardboard suits and May Day parades. Mm -hmm. Didn't seem like they were part of the same planet that we were on. <laughs> and I remember the first time I saw him, he, when he arrived in Geneva to have that memorable meeting. This is Mikhail Gorbachev. Yeah, Mikhail yeah. Gorbachev yeah. with Reagan. Yeah. I decided to go out to the airport to see what he looked like coming off the airplane. Mm -hmm. And I think I was the only American reporter who did that. And it was breathtaking. First of all, this handsome wife preceded him, extremely well clothed and well dressed. We'd never seen a wife who looked like that of a Soviet leader. He got off with a different kind of a hat, a well tailored top coat, stood up to make his remarks at the, uh, at the airport, reached into his, I remember every moment of this, reached into his back pocket, pulled out a clean linen handkerchief, patted his mouth so that he was prepared to go on television. We'd had these robots before of Brezhnev and, and all the others, and, and Kusigan and Gromyko, who walked with a stilted gait, and their feet really never touched the ground because they were always in limousines of some kind or another. And they, they put, frankly, the Sopranos to shame in terms of other conduct. <laughs> and suddenly there was this attractive new guy with this odd birthmark but he had a real charisma about him. And Reagan did something really smart. When Gorbachev pulled up, younger, vibrant leader, Reagan raced down the steps without a top coat on and the Switzerland cold to greet him. Gorbachev was dressed in a top coat, a scarf, and a hat. And it really put Reagan on equal footing right away. It looked great. You got to know Mikhail Gorbachev quite well over the course of the next few years. I did the first interview with him. And it was a long tussle among the three correspondents, as you might expect, Dan, Peter, and I, to who was going to get it. I was helped by a very able man by the name of Gordon Manning, who knew a lot of Gorbachev's apparatchiks and stayed with him. We poured more single malt scotch and prime rib down these people than you can possibly imagine <laughs> to get them to go along with us. We met only at the best restaurants in London and in New York, and we made our case. And they finally agreed to do it. And it was one hour, simultaneously translated. It was imperfect, but we got a lot out of him. He began with a bromide against the United States. And my clock was ticking because I knew we only had an hour. And so do I take him on on how he was characterizing the United States, or do we try to get at what was going on there? 
Anyhow, it was the beginning of a relationship. For about a year, he was persuaded I was the only American journalist that counted. I tried to keep that going. <laughs> it didn't work entirely well, but it, it worked out okay. And I never found him to be anything except extremely bright and charismatic and willing to really confront the Soviet failures. I mean, I remember him going out to Vladivostok, for example, one of the great seaports, and the military had this crazed look in their eyes. What is he talking about, that we're gonna start building down some of our military? And he liberated, intellectually, the Soviet people from where they had been stuck. Now, he made one big mistake, I thought, which was that he believed that the communist system could prevail and that they could keep the Soviet Union by dotted line in place, that that was important to him. The people around him, Yakovlev, who was his intellectual guru, and Shevardnadze, you remember, the foreign minister, didn't think they could do it. They thought that they had to break the system and reinvent it. And it was at the end of that time that Gorbachev was arrested in August of 1991, and shipped off to the Korea, and effectively his career was over because Yeltsin came as a great populist leader on the inside, stood on the tanks, and reclaimed Russia. I remember when we spoke for the first time, you said you basically remember the year of 1989 as the year you spent on airplanes. And you said it was not just you, it was Dan and Peter, Dan Rather and Peter Jennings as well. Can you perhaps recall for the audience a little bit about the momentum of that year globally or in Europe, just all the places that you went? Well, I don't think for people in our position there had ever been anything like it before or since, quite honestly. The, everything that we had assumed would be in place for a long time was coming apart. Mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union first, you know, it began to crack up around the edges and then from the center. And then that gave rise to what was going on in the Baltic states, what was going on in Czechoslovakia. Like for once it was a folk hero in this country, Poland was reclaiming its place. Uh, it was an astonishing time. And we were the first correspondents who had taken those jobs as anchormen who had access to satellites. So it changed the game for us. We could get on an airplane, the satellite dish would go with us with our technicians, and we could broadcast from anywhere on a short notice. Yeah. And we all had our legs. We were very competitive. We got along well. But when the balloon went up, we took off. It was Tiananmen Square, and it was Russia, and it was Czechoslovakia, it was Poland, and then the next year, it was Mandela going on. I mean, I was just on an airplane constantly. But that's what I was born to do, I felt. I wanted to be that kind of a journalist. And I had tough competition from the other two, so we drove each other, and everybody had little victories along the way at some point or another. Uh, when I left Nightly News, there was a, a big dinner for me in, in Waldorf, and Dan and Peter came out to talk, and Peter had the great line in which he said, people often ask, are you friends? And Peter said, we are, because we don't see each other that much. <laughs> And then he went on to say, but in fact, we are friends, and we have great respect for each other because we all got arrived at these jobs as working reporters. And it was a, a year or two years that was designed almost perfectly for us. How, how did your lovely wife, who's here with us this evening, feel about your being on an airplane for a whole year? Well, it was, you know, it was, it was amazing about, when I went to Tiananmen Square, uh, I would have been there with Gorbachev. Gorbachev, by the way, helped accelerate Tiananmen Square. He'd come to China. Yep and people heard him talking about perestroika and glasnost, mm -hmm. and the students in the capital said, that's our opportunity. So I stayed until right toward the end, and then I came home, and then it blew up on that weekend. So I went back right away. And to get back was not easy. I flew from New York uh, to Tokyo on Pan Am <laughs> in those days, and I flew all night. You know how long it takes to get to Tokyo. Got there, middle of the night, a wonderful Pan Am, Agents said, I don't know how we get you to Beijing, Mr. Brokaw, because all the commercial flights are now stranded. The State Department has a flight going in at, in two hours. So I called immediately to Washington, woke up Jim Baker's assistant, and I said, I need to be on that flight. She said, this is secretary's call. The secretary didn't talk to me. We've later become really close friends. He said, you tell Brokaw he's not getting on that airplane because he's a journalist. This is a State Department government airplane. So I went and got about an hour of sleep, and the, uh, the travel agent for Pan Am called me and he said, get up and get dressed right now. I've got you on a British plane as a medic officer. He said, <laughs> I said, okay, do I need to bring bandages? He said, no, just get on the airplane. <laughs> so I flew into Beijing and 
I'd been there many times before at that point, and it's one of the world's most populous cities. It was deathly quiet. I had never arrived in a city that was as quiet as that was. Mm. And everybody was afraid to move. The, all the Tiananmen Square was ringed with young uh, uh, uniformed officers and enlisted men who had come from the country and didn't like the students. And we were stuck. We didn't know what we were going to do for getting film and getting it out or video and getting it out. And I had this wonderful cameraman that I'd worked with all over the world had flown in from South Africa. Next morning I came down and he had a a box that he was putting on the back of a flying pigeon, which is their Model T uh, bicycle. And I said, uh, what's going on here? And he said, mate, I think we can make some pictures. His name was Tony Wasserman. And he took a small Sony camera and he put it down inside that box. We drilled a little hole, put the lens right up against it. They wired me up. I got my own flying pigeon. And we went bicycling through Tiananmen Square. And they didn't catch on. And they could see me narrating. This is the Forbidden City, Mao's pictures up there, these are the tanks that are out. One Chinese caught onto it, tickled the lens, and then quickly scooted away from us. But we got exclusive photographs out at that, at that point. So it was, you know, it was exciting and enterprising, and we were showing people what was going on. And then we were using a lot of Chinese official television because Deng Xiaoping had taken control at that point, and he was cracking down on the students but you could see the beginning of some economic liberation. That was going to be the trade-off. That was going to be the trade-off. There's a, there's a great line in The Sun Also Rises. A character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he responds, gradually and then suddenly. Right. And I think that's... That's what happened. That, you know, I think, you know, we've talked about this in the past. I really think that this, these revolutions were generational. That the, the older generation had come through the Long March in China, for example, and this is and the Cultural Revolution, and they were beaten down. In Russia, in East Germany, in the Baltics, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, a lot of the young people had, they didn't want to live like that. Their parents were accustomed to it. They were accustomed to no food. They were accustomed to control over their lives. Young people came along, and by then they had enough access to television to see how the rest of the world worked. So they became the vanguard of the change. Like Valenza was not a very old man. I mean, he was one of the most charismatic figures I've ever met. But, you know, he knew instinctively this is not how you can live. And he was a, you know, he was a shipyard worker and they had great passion about where they should go. So it was the rise in a way that the world had never seen before of the people from ground up saying we have fundamental human rights, the right to determine our own destiny and who we want to be and to take place in our country and its destination. And it was exhilarating. One of the most exciting moments for me was a small one. I got to Czechoslovakia on a Sunday. And it was bitterly cold. And they filled the soccer stadium. It was the beginning of the Velvet Revolution. And a Canadian Czech who had come from Czechoslovakia to Canada and recognized me, and he said, Mr. Broca, I can get you up on the top of the stage. We had to claw up the scaffolding like you know, acrobat, three stories up. I get on the stage, just then the crowd parted on the stage, and the crowd roared, and it was the first appearance of Alexander Dubček since he'd confronted the Soviets. And he stood there in his fedora and a small smile, and it was exciting to see this man know that he would have the back third of his life or the back fifth of his life in a different way than what he'd been living through. And he was a folk hero. That's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. You've mentioned solidarity. Let, let's bring the picture gradually closer to East Germany. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about solidarity and the way that it really served as a role model, the way it really inspired people, perhaps some of your memories from your times in Poland. Well, I, what I think was that, that it was, there were no borders anymore. You know, that this was, people were hearing about what was going on. Mm -hmm. They were moving across borders, and there were these clandestine radio reports that were going on back and forth. So it was creeping over into East Germany, which was the most controlled of all the states. But East Germany was not immune to what was happening as well. You know, you've got to remember that Krenz got thrown out and the, you know, the, and the Stasi was becoming dismantled uh, because in the East, in Germany, in Leipzig and other places, the young people were driving the revolution. You know, we, do we have the picture of of, uh, Raphael, could we have the image I, of Leipzig? Leipzig. This did not get enough attention in the United States. 
this was Leipzig, the, the week before the wall came uh, down. October 9th, 1989. Yeah, and there were th hundreds of thousands of young people on the streets, and they were demanding to get out. We also knew there was enormous pressure on Czechoslovakia that the GDR was worried about. They didn't want to have a bad relations with the Czech government. And so, uh, this is gonna lead up to the video. I came in one day, could we have house lights for just a minute, please? I wanna just introduce some people here. Um, I came in one Monday morning, and the foreign editor, Jerry Lamprecht, said to me, you know, there's not much going on in this country. Why don't you go to Germany? And it was like nine o'clock in the morning, and I thought, that's a good idea. My motto was, it's always a mistake not to go. <laughs> so I checked with the senior producer, of, executive producer of Nightly News, Bill Wheatley, he said, you know, I think that's a good idea. We have to make some arrangements. Uh, and then we ran the traps on it around the newsroom, told the director of, uh, the president of NBC News, this is what we're thinking of doing. I went to lunch with Richard Holbrook. Many of you know who he is. And he was very interested in Central Europe at that point. He said, that's a great idea. So that night I slipped out of the city and took off for Germany. Now I want to introduce you to, I hope you're all gathered together, the NBC team. It does take a village. They're here in the front row. It does take a village to produce all of this. So I'm not gonna go person by person, but you'd all stand up, please, and then I'll tell who we are. Marilyn Golevsky made all of our, and Cheryl Gould was in the control room that. <laughs> Martin Fletcher, Mark Kuznick. They were, they were all there, and, they, and, uh, and then Claire was just there with me again recently, and the Lamprecht boys, where are you? You're, you're in the back. Their father was the man who was the author of the idea of saying, go to Germany and giving me the greatest opportunity of the latter part of the 20th century to do the story that I did. And, um, and he doesn't get enough credit in my judgment. So I took off. And I, we, Jerry wisely arranged for a satellite, which you had to do in advance in those days, and a cherry picker, which is one of those big cranes that looks over Brandenburg Gate, not knowing whether we would need it or not. And what happened is that uh, when I got there the first day, the story really didn't warrant all the satellite costs and everything. So we just did some stand-ups and I did it. But I was getting in and out of East Germany a lot. And we were seeing things that we had never seen before. Uh, Michelle, who is not with us tonight, Newbert, who was in our Frankfurt Bureau at the time, spoke German, had wisely arranged for an interview with a man by the name of Schabowski, who was the propaganda chief coming over from the East for the next day. So everybody, all the team members had a place in all of this. And what happened is that the next day, we thought it was gonna be another slow day. Schabowski's news conference is late in the afternoon. And I go there and I'm exhausted. I have not been in bed since Monday night and now it's now late Tuesday afternoon. I had actually not been in bed at all, I don't think. And he begins this bureaucratic drone. What was interesting to me in this overheated room, that went on for about an hour, by the way, um, what was interesting to me in this overheated room was that the East German press was going back after him in a way they never had before. It was a new world. And he was trying to slough him off. Late in the hour, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a piece of paper he had never read before and effectively said that the residents of the GDR will have the opportunity, I don't remember the exact phrasing now, but to go out of the wall where they, at any of the exit points that they want to. That immediately, it was like something arrived from Venus. I mean, I had a German cameraman who looked at me and said, the wall is down. The AP correspondent on my right suddenly came awake. They were all trying to figure out what does this mean? And now Schabowski, I think, realized he'd gone too far. So he said, comrades, it's time to leave. He gets up and he leaves. And I had this appointment with him, ran upstairs. Michelle put her back against the wall to hold out the other correspondence and sat him down and did the interview with him. And he said, yes, this is what it means. They can come and go through any entrance in the hall. They honestly believed one thing, which is that they would come back. And as Mary <laughs> describes very graphically, there was a stipulation. They had to get visas. They couldn't just come and go wherever they wanted to through the wall. But once that word got out, as it did in East German television, then they were stuck. And we, I went running back down the stairs. There were a group of American foreign correspondents. And I said, it's for real. The wall is down. And by the time we got back to Checkpoint Charlie, were you with me at that point? I know you were, Mark. You were with me, Mark, right? Were you with me as well, Martin? You remember the, the guard there? We got out and said to him, he was waving us through, and he said, I said, what do you think? And he looked at me and he said, I'm not paid to think. 
you know, go on <laughs> through. So there were all these kind of steps along the way. It's now five o'clock in Germany. It's now seven o'clock in Germany, and it's one o'clock back here. They're, they're ginning up back at the NBC bureau to get all this on the air. They've already made the announcement. I was on a car phone with Gary Gutley saying what was happening. Uh, we get to the Brandenburg Gate about an hour before, 45 minutes before we went on the air. It was pretty chaotic. The German students from the West had got on top of the wall, and they were cheering the East Germans to come across who were still apprehensive. And then the East German guards turn on the water hose, and they began spraying everybody who was on the top of the wall. They drove off, drove off everybody but one man, leather jacket, arms upraised, back to him smiling, and I said to Martin Fletcher from our Tel Aviv Bureau, uh, Martin, go over and get that guy. He's the symbol of the new era in Germany. Martin came back, kind of doubled over, and he said, not what we think. I said, what do you mean it's not <laughs> He said, he's a drunk who's been living over the floor. <laughs> It's the first shower he's had in a long, long time. <laughs> Lauren, were you there for that as well? You, and so we said, okay, now the question is, we have promised New York that they're coming through the wall. We haven't seen them yet. <laughs> and so Mark was there on the phone to cameramen and everybody else saying, they're coming, we know they're coming. And one of our cameramen, Peter from London, came running from the Bonhomme Bridge and he had the footage just before we went on the air. So that's the setup. Now we should take a look at. Well, let me just, uh, just a little bit of historical um, background. The um, East German regime did not intend to open the wall. And right. so behind the scenes, uh, I, there's a lot of efforts going on to figure out how to reseal it. And you'll see in this footage, you'll see the East German regime using, using water cannons to get people off the wall, as you mentioned. And the reason they're not more effective is the water cannons were leaky. Otherwise, they would have been knocking even more people off the wall. It's, it's important to remember, too, the uh, East German Stasi, or secret police, was, as far as we know, the biggest surveillance organization in recorded history as a percentage of the population. The number of secret police, the absolute number in China is greater, but the Stasi is the largest force per capita that we know of. So you have this regime that doesn't want to open the wall, and you have the Stasi trying to reseal it, but you also have a peaceful revolution. You have people like in Leipzig who are newly emboldened. And so this amazing contest is building up, and it's taking place at the wall. And so that's what I think is so historically valuable about this footage that you shot that night. And I'm pleased that NBC is going to allow us to show a clip of you broadcasting from the Brandenburg Gate. And you can see this conflict unfolding. Even as you're standing in front of it, the water hoses are working in the Well, they were ter there was terror back with Cheryl's in the control room, and they thought I was going to get washed off the set <laughs> because it was coming closer and closer and closer. You'll also see that I'm very well dressed. And what happened is that I had taken one of my ratty outdoor jackets with me at the last minute, and it was, I thought, this is going to be on videotape forever. So we had a correspondent by the name of Mike Vesher, who just come from London and bought himself a beautiful cashmere top coat. And I said, that's mine for the next hour. And, <laughs> and you'll see me that. And he, he was going around in a leather jacket. <laughs> so um, should we roll the tape? Let's do it. Show Ra some of Raphael, can we show yeah. the video clip, please? A historic moment tonight. The Berlin Wall can no longer contain the East German people. Thousands pouring across at the Bornholmer Bridge. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. What you see behind me is a celebration of this new policy announced today by the East German government that now, for the first time since the wall was erected in 1961, people will be able to move through freely. This crowd has gathered here tonight spontaneously. From the East German side, they have been training water cannon, as you can see on some of the celebrants, but it doesn't seem to make much difference. We'll show you some videotape now as well of what happened earlier tonight when there were even more people atop the wall. The West German police have moved in here, suggesting that they move back, saying that the situation is already complicated enough, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. The people are here to celebrate freedom. For the East Germans, freedom to travel, a primary right for people anywhere in the world. The East German government said today that the East Germans can now go for a short visit or go to the West permanently as they go through the 
Berlin Wall at any number of the checkpoints. The East German government announced all of this to demonstrate to the world and to its own people, of course, that it is serious about reform. The wall, as we have known it since 1961, a sinister symbol of oppression, the wall has changed dramatically tonight. As we say goodnight from the wall on this night that is so memorable, it's worth reflecting what this ugly barrier has meant to all of us on both sides for 28 years now. From this side, the most eloquent testimony came from a young American president when he visited here just a few months before he was killed. That was the summer of 1963. And his words have special resonance for these events of the autumn of 1989. There are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. This generation of Germans has earned the right to be free, including the right to unite their families and their nation in lasting peace with goodwill to all people. Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. That went on until about three in the morning, actually. <laughs> we, 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 uh, we continued to broadcast. Cheryl was in the control room, and I said to her right before the clock at 6.30, I can't hear a thing. We're just going to have to, you're just going to have to stay with me. That was my famous phrase to teleprompter operators and control room people, stay with me. And I was ad-libbing all of that because there was no way that I could hold a script and get through it. And I was a child of the Cold War, so I was very familiar with the issues. And it was one of those nights in which we were just doing a live report. Um, and it went on until 2 in the morning. And the last report that I made, Gary Kelly was in the studio in New York. And he said, what are your final thoughts? And I said, in my lifetime, I thought 1968 was the defining year of my professional career. 16,000 people, Americans, died in Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson was forced to step aside. Dr. King was murdered. Bobby Kennedy was murdered. We had Chicago. The election of Richard Nixon running against George Wallace, people forget that, and Hubert Humphrey. And then I said this year, the determination of individuals to be free and to make their own choices about who they elect and how they live had risen up across a part of the world that had been held captive for so long. And most Russian experts that I knew thought that this would not happen until about now in this century, that it was accelerated I think a lot by generational determination by Mikhail Gorbachev and the realization the Soviet Union was collapsing at that point, the determination of Reagan to hold them responsible for their actions, and the determination of his advisors not to have this a shootout, that there are other ways that they could resolve that. So it was not just for a journalist, but for the whole world, it was an exhilarating time. And we're now at a different consequential time and how we deal with all those changes and the consequences for them. Raphael, could we perhaps have the slide of uh, Bornholmer Street? This is the place where the wall opened first, where the first border card snapped, right. where the first people uh, actually crossed. You see here the Bornholmer Street border crossing between the two halves of Berlin. And I, this was the, I remember that uh, your producer, Mark Kuznets, was very relieved when this happened because then he actually had footage for you to show to New York of people flooding across uh, the Bornholmer Bridge. Tell me about the guard that was there that night at the Bornholmer Bridge and all that he'd been going through. Sure. So Bornholmer Street, the, uh, the man on duty, uh, his name was Harold Yeager, he, he had no idea about the press conference. The press conference was a mistake. Yeah. Uh, the Politburo member at that press conference that you attended wasn't supposed to announce the opening of the wall. It was probably the worst press conference in history. <laughs> and so he 
he says what sounds like the wall is open, but, but he, he doesn't really mean it. And so the border guard at this, at this location calls in and says, have I got any new orders? And he's told, it's business as usual, keep the gates closed. Yeah. And he calls again, and he says, I've got a dozen people here saying, a member of the Politburo said I can get out. They tell him, it's business as usual. I interviewed him, he said he called his superiors 30 times. And they started insulting him. They started calling him delusional. They started saying he was a coward. And it really, it really got his back up. And the people were pleading with him to cross. And he finally snaps after hours and hours of this. And he finally says, you know, I, I helped build the wall. I've been working here for 30 years. They're going to call me a coward. And at the crucial moment, he gives in. He lets people flood across. And then in a, an ad hoc, uncontrolled fashion, the other border crossings open. And could we have, the Raphael, the picture of the Brandenburg Gate, please? The, uh, finally, at the Brandenburg Gate, where there is no border crossing at all, so people have to go up and over the wall, this is the scene. But there were, within the regime, forces that wanted to make this go away. And so you captured the water hoses. And after you stopped broadcasting, the Stasi actually resealed the Brandenburg Gate. Right. And one of the surprises in my research, uh, I was actually studying abroad in West Berlin in 1989, and I obviously was a young person and I wasn't a historian, but this is how I got interested in this topic and in, in history, full stop. It's always amazing what's really going on behind the scenes. There were actually armed units trained in military operations and urban terrain that were mobilized to reseal the wall. But because it opened in the middle of the night when the big bosses who could have ordered that were asleep, it was too late when they actually assembled a military tribunal the next morning. There were just too many people. So you just had this amazing event, which, which you captured on film, happening in an unplanned accidental fashion, and then it's too late for the regime to uh, roll it back. I know you've had contact with Gorbachev since then. Uh, I, I think you told me one time he came to see you after everything was said and done in the Soviet Union. He was out of office. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Mikhail Gorbachev's reflections on yeah, this. Well, time there are two things about Gorbachev. One was that he was on the phone a lot that night, we later okay. learned. Okay. And he was trying not to, he said, don't let it get out of control, uh, effectively, is what he was saying. Yeah. And then uh, about 10 years after the German unification, uh, an Atlanta lawyer who was a friend of Marx from Columbia, was a corporate lawyer for Coca Cola, organized. Uh, a meeting in, in, uh, in Atlanta, and he brought in George Bush 41, Helmut Kohl, who had been the chancellor at the time, and Mikhail Gorbachev. And it was a big international gathering about the new world in which we were living. And I was backstage with him, and I was, you know, I must tell you that you never get accustomed to this. These three pivotal figures in the 20th century were kind of laughing and joking and having a good time talking, and, and, uh, and we went on stage. And I introduced all of them, and then Helmut Kohl gave the first speech. Helmut Kohl was a big bear of a man, bluff, very conservative, very, very pro-German, great German nationalist. And he was determined to reunify Germany when there were strong feelings in Germany that they ought not to be unified, and certainly in Western Europe after the 20th century of those terribly induced savage wounds that the German people left on that part of the world and were determined to go even farther. Cole stood up and got tears in his eyes. And he turned to Gorbachev and he said, you did not send the tanks. And we were able to work this out on our own. And then he turned to uh, President Bush and he said, and you were for unification when others were. Margaret Thatcher was very outspoken about, let's not have unification here. We're not going to go through that again. Since then, I've been spending a lot more time on the, the backstage stuff that was happening. Jim Baker went to Russia and offered Gorbachev a couple of uh, opportunities to make some choices. One of us, he said, would you rather have a unified Germany outside of NATO or a unified Germany inside of NATO? Well, nobody wanted them outside. They wanted to have pressure on them. They didn't want them to be, again, on their own. And he, and he starred that. And then George Bush, 41, came up with a checklist of 17 ideas for making it easier for Russia to readjust to the new realities. They were all rejected by his cabinet, which were mostly filled by hawks in those days. All the 17 points were. We didn't know a lot of that at that time. And the question was, how do you build a relationship between the new Russia and the West? Russia, still very proud, enormous capacity, great land mass, great natural riches, 
completely fouled up economy, but they probably find a way to work their way out of that. NATO expanded, but they expanded toward Russia. And the Russian leaders found that a great insult. They, they, they were coming in their direction. Rather than saying, how can we work this out? There was even a point at one point of having Russian troops in East Germany, as you know, in the old East German area, making a militarized zone. But that was rejected. So we pushed hard back, and that was some of the political pressure that came from this country. Hindsight is always an easy thing to talk about now, but you know it was a tricky piece. And my own strong feeling is that we were at once a little aggressive about NATO, and at the same time, I think we lost the core value of NATO. We had been a strong alliance with everybody seeing their place in the world pretty much the same way. We we're gonna be the bulwark against Russian and communism expanding. And then with the Euro and the, and the self-determination that was going on in the European states, we kind of lost sight of that. So now in the NATO alliance, you can't put together a group to go down to the Middle East and fight on behalf of Western values. They're all gonna make their own decisions. So there was a huge domino effect. And watching all of this and weeping the night the wall came down because of the blow it was to Russian nationalism was a KGB agent by the name of Vladimir Putin. And he, he, very ambitious man. He worked in St. Petersburg for the party. He met every important American at the airport with his car as just a driver, got to know them, and had a vision for how he wanted Russia to re resurrect itself which we now see playing out. Yeah. How did I do, Professor? Is that okay? Excellent. <laughs> We're going to go to your questions in just a minute, so if we could um, collect the cards. But I'd uh, be interested to know how this night, you've had obviously just a, a long, unparalleled career in journalism. When you look back at these pictures, what, what piece of your journalism career do they represent? Do you remember that as the happiest night or the most moving night? Oh, the, when I look at the pictures? When you, when you watch the, this the footage. The big again. thought is I'd like to be 49 again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what comes through. Um, you know, I was so busy just trying to keep track of everything yeah. and making sure I was getting it right. I did think, this is a big story, Brokaw. Do not screw it up. It's going to be there forever. Try to get it right. <laughs> it was, in, a, in many ways, because I was 49, I'd been at it a while, and I'd lived through that era, it was the payoff for my investment in my journalistic career. You know, I'd paid attention to these issues. I took them seriously. And I'd been in Russia a lot, and I'd been in the, in the Soviet satellites a lot. And, I, you know, I, did I think presciently that I was going to be witness to this kind of a revolution? No. I did think that Gorbachev was a great man. And I think he started something that he'll later get credit for, that he recognized it intellectually. But having been in Russia, you knew the desperate straits of those people wherever you went. And I've been all over Russia. I've been in the Russian Far East and the, and the peninsulas, and I've been in the central part of the country. And there was no place that was nirvana. They were leading desperate lives. And I thought at some point, that can't continue if we keep the political pressure on. So at the end of the next, Mark and I were together the next day, and we stood exhausted watching those people come through the gate through the Berlin Wall, and they were really coming and pouring through the next morning. And their acid-washed jeans and their cheap, uh, their cheap baby carriages and the trance who cycle cars belching all this diesel fuel. And they were coming from the moon to Earth. And it was the damnedest thing to see because the wall was about as wide as the stage, but quite high. And it had imprisoned them. It was San Quentin. And then they came into one of the most cosmopolitan, prosperous cities in the Western world, Berlin. They went from seeing these rundown, empty grocery stores to showcases filled with Mercedes and, 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 and you know, all the great cars of the world, great shopping places on the Kurfürstendamm, and they were slack-jawed. And then they became a little bit like zoos and an animal because the Westerners came out and just stared at them. <laughs> Some people had been having hand communication across the wall, a tailor could see every morning from the west a guy getting up on the other side and they would kind of wave to each other. They had this fabulous reunion that went on that day. So it, it was you know, memorable and consequential. And when I got back, I wrote about it for the New York Times. And what I said was that I didn't expect to see this, but that it was frankly inspirational to see it, you know, that, that people could rise up 
and it was peaceful, and not a shot was fired, and that is that, astonishing. That is astonishing. Now, the irony is that night, the clip we just saw, your wife didn't see that, right? No, she's here tonight, and she's <laughs> going to be embarrassed by this, but <laughs> we, had, we were having some work done in our apartment. We were living in a rental over on the west side, and Meredith had gone out somewhere that night and came back and uh, didn't turn on the television set and kind of went to bed and got up the next morning, walking the dog in the park, People were coming up to her with tears in their eyes and saying, you must be so proud of your husband. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and went home, and, um, and some of you may have watched the other night when my phone went off on election night, and I pretended like it was a call to Meredith saying, yes, I'll bring home the milk and the loaf of bread, and I'll feed the dog in the morning. You just sleep in, so I kind of get back at her. <laughs> Well, that's excellent. Well, I'd like to take uh, some of the cards, take some of the audience questions. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. We got a lot of questions. So, <laughs> so do you have any regrets in your career? Did I what? Do you have any regrets in your career? You know, I really don't. I don't have any regrets in my life or in my career. I've been going through some health issues that some of you know. And um, I'm, I'm going I'm to get through it. I certainly have survived it. I've done it with the help of Meredith and my family and this great medical team. It's been a wake-up call for me because I've been the luckiest guy in the world and uh, who I married and where I grew up, the way my career played out. And at the end of this ordeal, I'm still the luckiest guy in the world. And I don't have any regrets. I really don't. <laughs> And another member of the audience would like to know a little bit more, that night as you were standing there broadcasting from the wall, what was going through your head? A little more about the details well, of that it, night. I have, I don't think I'm overstating this, this crew knows better. I have a kind of teleprompter that runs in my mind. I can, <laughs> if I have an idea about can where I I'm Can I get one of those? <laughs> I, if, I, if I know where I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get there. I, you know, it's a long time I've been doing this. So I can get a central theme that I know that has to play out when I came on and I said the most historic night. I thought about that, but after that, I was off to the races. I was ad-libbing as best I could about what was going on around us, what the likely effects of it were gonna be, and, uh, and you just concentrate on getting it right and make sure that the sentence is parse and that you keep advancing the narrative of the story. This is not just facts-driven, it really is a dramatic narrative that you're trying to tell the American people about what's happening here. And you kind of put yourself in the middle of all of that because you're the storyteller. And, uh, and that business that I did at the end, I wanted to put it in some kind of a context about 68 versus 89 and all that we've been through. And I think in the long form of historical retrospection, people will look back on that time as a seismic change in the world. So another person would like us to talk a little bit more about the press conference. And uh, by way of context, let me say that uh, the reason I really wanted to interview you was that you were, as far as I can tell, the only journalist, American, German, French, Martian, who actually guessed right, went all in, built a broadcast platform, got a cherry picker, yeah. spent real money just on the chance that something big would happen. And it paid off spectacularly, but it, it must have been a bit of a hard sell to the people who paid well, the bills. Well, you know, we, we, we <laughs> I shouldn't say this out loud, I suppose, we kind of <laughs> circumvented the senior leadership of NBC News and did it on our own, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> we decided this is what we're gonna have to have if we have to have it. Jerry Lamprecht was again a hero in that. Marilyn made the arrangements. And we got that cherry picker on the satellite. And in those days, you couldn't just order up a satellite. I mean, you just couldn't say, bang, I need a satellite. Now you can't. They're available everywhere, and they're portable. But we had to put the order in in advance. Not even German television had a satellite that night. They couldn't show as much as we did. And uh, later, uh, a lot of my friends who were German journalists came to me kind of weepy, saying, you got to be there. I was in Brussels, or I was in Washington. I was just forced to watch. So we were in the perfect place at the perfect time for the perfect storm. And everybody should have one of those in your career. I've had several, Dan and Peter had, had several as well, quickly stated. But you know, it's exhilarating 
And it does take the village to do that. People thinking ahead, spending the money, this could pay off. As I said earlier, my motto was always, it's a mistake not to go. That's how I got to Mandela. That's how I got to Tiananmen Square. That's how I got to Czechoslovakia. One of my favorite stories about Czechoslovakia is that at we're two o'clock in the morning after the week of the Velvet Revolution, we have a famous Polish camera crew that brings lemon vodka from Poland, handmade. <laughs> and we always drink to the revolution, uh, <laughs> whatever excuse is needed. And the man who makes it, large curly-headed sound technician by the name of Majik, came to me after we'd had several shots of this. And he was weeping and he said, it's not fair at home, it's not fair. And I said, Majik, it's a great, great day. I mean, Czechoslovakia, yeah, the goddamn Czechs. Two weeks, polls, 20 years we've been doing this. <laughs> We're just now getting to where they've gotten in two weeks. It's not fair. So we went back to drinking, and it was a lot better. Well, what, as I said, what amazed me about researching this was not only that in a time when it was not easy to broadcast around the globe, when you really had to spend real money and right. satellite ahead of time, that you were really the only one who had done it. And the, um, I should say, by way of explanation, the, the leader of West Germany, Chancellor Kohl, on that night was actually in Poland for a state visit to mark the 50th <coughs> anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War. So the, the elite of the German West German press corps were in Poland with him. And uh, Cole and his staff, when I, when I interviewed them, they said, you know, we had no idea anything was going to happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't have let the chancellor go to Poland on the biggest night in recent German history. So uh, you, really, you really had the field yourself. And the other thing that amazed me is not only did you have that set up the Brandenburg Gate, but you also went to the press conference. You actually went to the world's worst press conference and, uh, and most importantly, had the exclusive interview with the spokesman organized for afterwards. Right. So the only person to whom he spoke afterward was you. And uh, that was, I think, a, a real triumph of journalistic planning there. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about just that feeling. So this press conference is an hour-long press conference. And correct me if I'm wrong. And then I'm going to have you tell the back piece of the story, okay. of what happened to him afterwards. Okay. Uh, well, he was, he, if you see the photo, if you see the video of him, he, uh, he's trying to maintain self-confidence, obviously. G Gunter Schabowski. But he knows he's in trouble. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> that, he's, that he's overstepped in some way and he's not quite sure what. And then I talked to him about what is it like to live under the system that now is coming apart. And, uh, and he gave me a kind of non-answer to that, but he was leaning back very casually. I remembered, I wrote about it later, that I remembered him taking his glasses off, but he didn't. I looked at the video and he didn't do that. But he did say again, yes, they can go out through any part of the wall. And it was upstairs in this little tiny office. A year later, I went back to see him. He was a changed man. He was living in a very tiny apartment. He'd gotten my letter, he read it. He, I think it had his pension taken away from him at that point. He didn't go to jail, but he, w he was on trial for a while, he right? Was, he was convicted, yeah. Yeah, he went to jail. And his life was over. But, you know, he bought into the GDR Politburo all those years. Now, I run down, tell everybody it's over. What happens to Schabowski when he leaves there? Yeah, so this is amazing. So the press conference has taken place and uh, he has unintentionally made it sound like the wall is open. Uh, he hadn't meant to do that. He's getting very worried. He does an exclusive interview with you. He tries to do it in English, which is a huge mistake. His English is terrible. And what he says in English makes matters worse. Right. And uh, if you just hear that English version, you left that thinking he just confirmed the wall's open, and that's what it sounds like in English. Yeah. But he goes home, he doesn't think he's done that. He actually just goes home early. He's supposed to go back to some important party meeting. He tells his driver, I can't do that. I'm gonna, he says, take me home to where I live. And all the party leaders live in this gated community to keep them safe from their own population. And so it's this collection of houses and they can all look at each other. And he, he has his driver driving back to this gated community and the car pulls in and it's, you know, it's by this point sort of eight o'clock at night and all the lights are out, the windows aren't on, or the lights aren't on in the windows. And he just feels like, oh, that was a bad press conference. You know, he's just gonna basically have an early night of it until the phone starts ringing. And this starts to be a very, very bad night for the party leadership. And the uh, press release that he wrote, uh, the man who actually wrote it was so relaxed about the press release that he actually just went to the theater. So he handed in his press release. He goes off to see a production, uh, a, a Goethe production, uh, and 
He comes home from the theater at 11 o'clock with his wife, and his son opens the door and says, Dad, the interior minister has called about 10 times, and the wall is open. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this interior ministry official says, what? And his, his son says something about a press release. And this man just thinks, oh my God. And without taking his coat off, he just turns around and he goes back to the office. And every phone is ringing. Everyone's trying to figure out what happened? What just happened? What did we just do? And so as you're having this amazing night, <laughs> The entire regime. I'm having the best moment. He's having the worst. He's having the worst one, exactly. Uh, the border and the border guards are baffled. So there's this sort of unbelievable story unfolding of these sort of parallel realities where you have people who believe the wall is open and border guards who don't think it is, and they're in collision. And it's amazing because it doesn't actually become violent. That is amazing. I mean, as someone who was, as I said, living in West Berlin in '89 and who just remembers the happy side of things, I retroactively got chills when researching this book, realizing that you know if somebody had lost their cool that it, it really, it, things could have gone badly wrong. Now I know later in the night, you, you're covering, you're, you're broadcasting live from the Brandenburg Gate through the night, your cameras capture footage of people being dragged away. Yeah. I wonder, like, did you kind of look at each other? Like, there was great confusion. Right, I was gonna say, well, how, did you, how did you process that? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I don't actually remember how we processed it. Yeah. I was terrified when the cannon came up that they were gonna shut down the wall at that point. Yeah and that we would not have what we thought was the most dramatic story. Yep. Um, but by and large, it quickly got quite peaceful. Everybody understood this was out of control, uh, out of their hands of controlling, and that it, you know, it, and it happened swiftly. I'll tell you a couple of other quick stories about it. We had been dealing with some dissidents in the East who were from the theater arts crowd, and one of them had a, a state-subsidized theater group, and within three days, he realized maybe this is not what I thought. I went over to see him and he was gonna lose a state subsidy and he wanted money for the interview and he was, he was frankly ticked off. He thought, you know, wait a minute, I've been taken care of, now I gotta get out there and deal on my own. So there was that mindset that they'd been living for so long on just the government dole. And as I've been going around Germany in recent years or in German institutions, I've been asking people, I kind of size up their age and say, where were you the night the wall came down? And any number of them, the German uh, Minister of Information at the, at the embassy in Washington uh, said to me, I was a student in Leipzig listening on radio. Now think about that. There he was listening on radio as a German st student in the East, and now he's the director of all of their information here. I, I assume that a lot of you in this audience must know that Angela Merkel and her sister walked over from the East that night. They were laboratory technicians stuck in no-gain jobs. Now she's the chancellor of the most powerful woman in Europe, if not one of the most powerful women in the world. So there was this kind of coming together with or without state sanction that was going on, and people were having different reactions to it. I, I think I said earlier that Helmut Kohl was enraged that he was booed by the Berliners, who were always the most liberal and anti-national German citizens, when he came out and asked them to sing Uber Alice. Now, how security allowed me to do this? I was down in the basement with Helmut Schmidt and with Willy Brandt, who were waiting to go on. I was just standing around, and Cole came through, and he was in a rage, and because he wanted to unify Germany and bring back Germanic pride in, in, in one nation, and the Berliner crowd, you know, were not going to have anything of it that night. So the dynamics were really, really in play in rebuilding Central Europe, especially after. World War II, but there it is. It's the central part of Germany, I mean, of Europe and the economy again, doing the most innovative things, the strongest military. And we'll see what the 21st century brings. Raphael, could we have the third slide again, please, of Bornholmer Street? Just because you've mentioned German Chancellor Angela yeah. Merkel, yeah. I just wanted to show Bornholmer Street again. Bornholmer Street that night was almost like a magnet because it was where the border opened first. It was where people went to, uh, everyone just immediately heard, go to Bornholmer. And so Angela Merkel, who was, as you said, at that point, not in politics, uh, not a dissident, uh, was a young chemist, was coming through, was coming back from the sauna, and she goes over the bridge at Bornholmer Street and she goes into the West, and that's the night that changes her life. And this is true of so many people. There's so many people, 
today who are positions of power now, the two biggest names, of course, are Angela Merkel and Vladimir Putin, whose lives are, are forever shaped by, these, by this night, these events we're talking about. So even though these seem like history, they have left deep roots in the politicians of today. And um, the, uh, the legacy, I think, is, is, especially in the case of Vladimir Putin, very, very problematic. Uh, and one of the other questions I have from the audience is, um, was a peaceful outcome that night assured? Now, from a historical point of view, I, I say the answer to that is no. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were efforts undertaken to reseal the border, and they, they could have gotten ugly. But I'd be interested to know, f when you were there that night, did you have a sense of threat? Did you have a sense of, gee, this is happy now, and people celebrating now, but this could tip, this could get ugly? I was uncertain. I didn't know what would happen next. I thought yeah. at some point they may reseal it. Yeah. I thought that that might happen. That they would, you know, they would get their act together and say, "Okay, it stops," and uh, and then it was clear that they didn't have the capacity to do that, and it would be unacceptable to the West. But at that point, you know, it was jump ball. We didn't know where this thing was going. Yep. Uh, and I was trying not to get too far out in front of it, because I've learned over the years as a journalist, you know, that events take their own course at some point. Certainly did that. And I had a couple of other interesting experiences. Marcus Wolf who was the great head of Stasi, who was out of the job by then. Head of, of foreign espionage for Stasi, right. sometimes called the man without a face, inspiration for the Jean Le Carré novel. He was the greatest spy that they had, and he ran all their, all their agents in there. And we looked in the paper, Michelle, who's not here tonight, unfortunately, and saw that he was speaking at a church the next morning. He had a new book out. And uh, he's, in, you know, John Le Carré claims that he'd never use him as, a, as the character, but in fact, it was pretty clear that he was built on him. So we went over to the church to hear him. And he came out looking every inch Marcus Wolf. I mean, he had a short leather jacket on and a brush cut. And he was all friendly. And, you know, I've been warning them for some time this could not be sustained and that it would come down in the way that it did. And he was rewriting history on the road right in front of us. Then we found out where Guglielm had been, one of his agents who had penetrated Billy Brant's office. Frankly, he'd gotten all that way in before they discovered him, and then they shipped him back to the east. He had a dasha out in the eastern sector, out on the lake, very nice little place, and I went out there to interview him. And he was completely absorbed in the idea that this is a total failure. This is a terrible thing to happen. The revolution must go on. They've lost their minds. We've got to reignite it. I'm too old to do it, but there are people who will light this up again. And uh, I remember this figure as I walked away, sitting on this chair beside the lake, thinking, you know, what goes on in the mind of somebody like that after all this, after they, what they've seen? It's not going to be reversed. Right. But he was such a true ideologue right. about the role of the revolution. Right. So there were stories wherever you turn. Yeah, yeah. That man who wrote the press release, the badly worded press release that yeah. Gunter Shabovsky read, that made it sound as if the wall was open. I, I interviewed him, and he's still a true believer. Yeah. He was not a man who was, I, I sometimes get asked, were these people secretly working from inside to destroy the system? And the answer is no, not at all. These people yeah. were, were loyalists. They didn't intend to do this. They were horrified by what happened. And he, to this day, still believes in the ideals of communism. He just th thinks the East German government was just uh, incapable of carrying them out. So these, it, it was, this is a really amazing story of, of unintended consequences, of a, a sequence of events triggering in perfect but unplanned sequence. And many of the components were actually loyalists, such as Harold Yeager, the border guard at uh, Bornholmer Street, who snaps and who opens the wall. So another question we have is, how did life change for East Germans and East Europeans after the wall fell? You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's still a divided, it's still in many ways a divided country. The East is still poor. They didn't have early job trainings. They don't have a skill set, many of them. And the most successful business now in East Germany is a mobile shopping uh, cart, a uh, truck. It takes groceries from villages to villages because they don't have their own grocery stores in a lot of the towns in the East. And so this truck pulls up and they kind of become a mobile grocery store. In the West, that wouldn't happen. And the West looks down on their Eastern cousins. There's a kind of you know, second-class citizen attitude about them. Obviously, the best of them rose up and got out of there. On the other hand, there are these dramatic examples. When you see me on this side of the Brandenburg Gate, and you know that it's the east on the other side of the Brandenburg Gate, if you go to Germany now, 
on the other side of the Brandenburg Gate. It's the Kapinski Hotel, which is the most luxurious hotel in Berlin, across the street from the Starbucks, across the street from the Porsche dealership. You know, it's the transformation, bang, in 25 years. And it's always still a little astonishing to me about how quickly things can change, never more so than in China, frankly. You know, I was there in 74 and 76, again in 83, and then again in 87 and 85. And when I first went, everybody was living in hutongs, and they had common toilets and common washstands in the morning, and they had soft coal for cooking right in the heart of the capital. And the last hotel had been built in 1926 at that time. I go back several times and watch the evolution of it. And for the Olympics, which is the apotheosis of modernization, shipping in highways and flowers and building the, all the stadia, and, and the banking system was making so many people rich, and I couldn't find any of the old hotongs. I got on my bike, and I remembered where they were, and I went and I found one and barely made it way back to the hotel because I was completely lost and the city had changed so much. So when you liberate people and you, you let the kind of inherent inventiveness and determination take hold, it really is transformational, politically, economically, culturally, and otherwise. Um, and it, 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 we've been privileged to witness it. I think, frankly, we're, you know, we're living at a time of extraordinary privilege and watching what's going on in China alone about the transformation of that 2,000-year-old civilization and how it's going to end up. Can the leadership stay ahead of that boulder called population and consumer demand rolling down behind them? And then we have the darkness of the jihadist movement in the Middle East and a Russian nationalist in, uh, in Moscow now. So things are always vibrant. Yeah. So this was the image um, of Bornholmer Street. Again, this is where the bridge, uh, the border opened first. And this is where Angela Merkel walked on the night that changed her life. Where, sitting, where we are sitting would be East Berlin. On the far side of the bridge is West Berlin. You can see in that guard tower two border guards looking, right. looking on. And uh, this site became just like a magnet for people all night. And uh, oh, if, it's amazing how many people in positions of authority now have their own Bornholmer Street story of that night. Uh, I, I got asked to talk, one, a question for me, to talk a little bit more about Harold Yeager, who is, again, the man in charge. Uh, Harold Yeager, by causing this, by issuing the order to open the gates, Harold Yeager became the man who opened the Berlin Wall in a practical, hands-on sense. And by doing that, he put himself out of a job. Uh, I, I interviewed him twice. He explained that he, after this, he never again held steady work. He actually worked for a while as a taxi driver in United Berlin, and people would actually ask him, hey, can you take me to where the wall used to be? <laughs> That's a pretty touching story, actually. And he, uh, he, uh, that job didn't last. He didn't like it. He owned a little store that sold newspapers. The newspaper business turned out to be not such a good business. Uh, his store went out of business. He ended up as a security guard. And now he lives in a, like a cottage. It's really meant to be a summer cottage, but he's winterized it. It's near the Polish border. And he lives on a small pension. After Germany unified, there are complicated rules governing the pensions, but um, he is allowed to get some percentage of his pension. Uh, since he was a Stasi officer for nearly 30 years, there were no medals involved. He didn't win any big honors. But I think the world is very, very fortunate that he made this decision. He explained to me that before he made this decision, he turned to his men and he said, should we shoot all these people or should we open up? And it's just one of those breathtaking moments. And you think, you know, what if somebody else had been on duty that night? Uh, the, the other people at his rank, the other they people who could have had the night shift, some of them were hardliners. And, you know, they might have made different choices. And what's amazing for me about working on this time period is the interaction between the details, you know, these individual decisions with the broad forces, right? The, the, the people, the pressure that people want to get out, the Cold War contest, the decay of the Soviet Union, it all comes together in an amazing way this night. And, you know, the decisions of this one man really helped to shape the world ever afterward. Um, another member of the audience would actually like you to talk a little more about President Reagan. Uh, I don't know how well you knew President Reagan. Uh, but they'd like to know a little bit more about uh, his Cold War leadership. Well, I, you know, I, I actually think that it was a combination of Reagan and then seeing the opportunities that were available to him there and the wise counsel 
of George Shultz and Jim Baker and others saying there's another way to do this. I think that SCI did put a lot of pressure on Russia. They knew they couldn't compete. That was what Reykjavik was all about. And it was at Reykjavik that we knew that the Russians had played their last best card and couldn't get it done about the elimination of all nuclear missiles. And there was this big debate in the administration. If we keep them, that keeps the pressure on them. If we take them all away, which Schultz was in favor of doing, Kissinger thought it was a bad idea. The other Hawks thought it was a bad By idea. By way of explanation, this is a summit meeting in 1986 in Reykjavik yeah, between and President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And briefly, at one point in the conversation, they agreed to eliminate the, in, the entire strategic nuclear arsenals of the U.S. and the Soviet right. Union. So at one point in the conversation, they agreed to get rid basically of all nukes the U.S. and the Soviet Union had, and then they back away from it. And it's one of these great missed opportunities in the Cold War. So to continue. Uh, one, of, one of the things I remember from a, from a, a visual point of view is that they came out during lunch to talk to the cameras, and they were both smiling. And, uh, and we were beginning reports from inside that they were making real progress. At the end of the afternoon, they came out, and I'd been covering Reagan since 66 at that point, and he had his tan raincoat on, and he had his lips pursed like this. And I said, take a picture of the noontime appearance and contrast it with this one. He is angry as hell, because I've, I've watched that expression a lot of time. Gorbachev's talking a mile a minute, trying to get the deal put back together again, and they couldn't possibly do it. So then Gorbachev knew he was up against the wall, that they didn't have the budget to compete with SDI. They'd had bad crops. They had real economic issues going on in Russia, and they were going to have to make some kind of a deal. A lot of people forget that they were in such desperate condition that when we started Iraq one. Bush 41 went to Helsinki and met with Gorbachev and said, here's a big check, stay out. So we gave them a lot of money to subsidize their economy and keep it going and promise them economic advice as well. There are a lot of parts in play, including the stake of the world, quite honestly, about getting this thing resolved personally. So I, I do think that Reagan gets the credit that a lot of people are still are reluctant to give him. I used to have this argument with Holbrook about SDI. I said, you know, I've talked to enough that I believe that SDI pushed him up against the wall. He said it was more economic. I said, I think that helped push the, based on everything I was able to hear from the inner circle, that helped push him up against the wall. And they were having terrible agricultural problems right straight through Gorbachev's term. So he will get credit for staring down the Soviet Union and not a shot was fired. And that is astonishing. No missiles were launched, no tanks rolled. Uh, it was a peaceful resolution to, if you grew up in my age, we were ducking under desks and people were building bomb shelters and they were thinking it was gonna come at any moment. We felt relatively safe in South Dakota until we learned all the missile sites were all over the state, <laughs> damn it. You know, they were gonna come after us first. Uh, but it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it really is, huge punctuation mark in history that two countries had enough capacity to destroy the world and chose not to do it. So just for background, SDI strategic defense initiative, Star Wars, the idea of a, a, a defensive nuclear arsenal, that was something President Reagan invested heavily in and it was difficult for the Soviet Union to keep up with that as well. Um, and then there is a question for me, uh, what inspired me to write this book and what surprised me uh, in this research? Um, I, was, I actually wrote a previous book about the, leg the legacy of these events. So I wrote a book about the foreign policy that followed the fall of the wall. And I, because I actually ended up living in Berlin for a number of years, was familiar with the story and I mistakenly assumed that people back home were familiar with it too. And uh, when I would give talks about my, my other book, which is about the foreign policy after the fall of the wall, I would get up and say things like, hello, I'm here tonight to talk about the foreign policy that followed the accidental opening of the Berlin Wall. So, and I would get interrupted often at that point. People would say, wait a minute, time out, time out. What do you mean the accidental opening of the wall? And I got that question so many times, I realized that people didn't know this amazing story. And so I basically decided to write the prequel 
So in my next life, when I have perfect hindsight, I'll write these books in the correct order. <laughs> but for now, I've written them in the reverse order. And so this is the story of the revolution from below and how the wall comes down unintentionally. And then my previous book is The Reaction from Above. And what really inspired me when I started, uh, sorry, what, what, what surprised me when I started writing this book, I realized it was, it was actually to tell the, the story of how the wall came down, I was going to have to write history from the middle. What I mean by that is it was not a book about the politicians you've always heard of. This is a book about Harold Yeager, right, the deputy Stasi officer on duty through the night, or the Gunter Schabowski, the spokesman, or, or people we haven't even talked about, uh, dissidents, uh, undercover uh, activists like Ziggy Shefka. I know you interviewed him on NBC the other night. Ziggy Shefka was an activist who used his camera to fight the dictatorship. He would secretly record videos of human rights and environmental abuses, and then he would smuggle them at great risk to himself out to the West, where they'd be broadcast on channels that people could receive back in the East. Uh, I, I was amazed at all these people who are not famous household names. They're individuals who get caught up in the sweep of history. But amazingly, on that night, they all become links in a causal chain. They don't even realize they're in it. And as I've already said, some of them don't even realize they're loyalists. They don't even realize that they're in this causal chain. So perhaps we'll end with uh, uh, this uh, question from the audience. It's a good general question. What do you worry about most given that we are living in such unsettled times? Um, I worry most these days short term, I'm a journalist, remember, I'm always looking at the next news cycle, and I think that this news cycle will go on for a long time. I worry a lot about jihadism, a lot, a lot, about how you deal with it. And we're, this is gonna define uh, Obama's presidency, not just the election of last week, but how he works his way through ISIL and trying to put the Middle East back together again. Is it possible to do it? I'm not so sure. These are tribes and cultures and faiths that have been at war with each other for 2,000 years, and they have found what for them is the perfect enemy, which are the Western values. And they operate in the darkness of medieval beliefs. There's nothing in the Quran about beheading journalists, for example. They're killing children and women of their own background. They may be Sunnis versus Shiite, but they're all Muslims. And they're doing that with cold, military, well-financed efficiency. No one knows more about this than Martin, who's based in Tel Aviv for us. Or I recommend to you this weekend looking at, at Richard Engel, who got into Korbani, which is the stronghold for the Kurds. It's a very complicated part of the world. And he talked and saw, you saw there the life and death struggle that goes on every day. And it's primitive hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Can you contain it to that part of the world? I was just in Ottawa the other day. They had that terrible incident up there at the Parliament, as you know, and ISIL has now identified Canada by name as a target. We're coming. And the kinds of immigration policies that we have, it's not so hard to get in here. And how you contain it is very difficult because it's rooted in these deep, dark beliefs that their mission in life, whatever it costs them in their life, is to take down the Western culture and to be faithful to their most perverted views of what Islam is all about. When we do airstrikes, and that ricochets around the internet, it's the best recruiting tool they have. They come from out of Hamburg, and they come out of Germany, and they run down there, and they join up. If you read Stan McChrystal's book about his years in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, he said the best recruiting tool they had was Abu Ghraib, which nobody in the Bush 43 administration really took responsibility for. It lit up what he called the rat line. He said upper middle class Muslim young men raced to Syria with bank accounts, with big cash hoards. And he said it was very efficient. They checked in their money and they got an account slip for it and it was well managed. They were trained. They get all the arms that they want. A lot of them came out of the Iraqi army, the Ba'ath army, and they know what they're doing. And they're moving across borders. Now there are reports that they've been diminished some they'll rise up again. And how we stop them, it's not gonna be just the United States alone. I think that our Arab allies have failed us, quite honestly. I think that we need a lot more help from Saudi Arabia and others in uniform and confronting them. And that worries me a lot. 
Well, I know, um, I just want to say on a personal level, I know you've been going through some very um, difficult medical treatment, and I'm glad that you have made time and, and taken energy to come and spend this evening talking with me, sharing with everyone here your memories of this incredibly important night in global history. I know I'm very grateful, and I'd like to all ask you to join me in thanking Mr. Brokaw. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, listen. I always, I always remember, I couldn't have done it without this team in front of me and the father of these two boys in the back, and I'm grateful to all of you for your interest. This is a terrific book, not just because she treats us well. <laughs> she is a very, very highly regarded professor of European history. And she has a wonderful backstory. Her dad was an auto worker first, and I love this story. And said her mother and dad said to her, "We can't send you to Europe. We're going to bring Europe to you. We're going to get an exchange student." And as she Mary describes it, the other people in the Detroit areas knew that their children were speaking French or Spanish, so they'd say, "We want a Spanish or French person. We'd like to have a girl, and no smoking." Their parents got a German who smoked. <laughs> <laughs> and it changed her life. It became, it became her brother, and it, it turned her on to German history and Central European history. Went to Harvard, went to Cambridge after getting her PhD at Yale. <laughs> now she's hotly competed for by USC, Harvard, and Cambridge, all three. So you're, in the, <laughs> you're in a real modern academic rock star presence, and you'll see it all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really cannot use nuclear weapons as an ordinary element of strategy. Well, now I understand Ronald Reagan a lot better, actually. Yeah. And, and it's truthful. Yeah. Why? Because the first 